Let's return again and um, review an example that we uh, covered several sections ago. Uh, we were looking at the problem of a transmission line which had a length, uh, electrical length of uh, one eighth lambda, an eighth of a wavelength. It is terminated uh, with a load that is a short circuit. Its reflection coefficient, load reflection coefficient value is minus one. And the question is, what is the uh, input reflection coefficient for this resulting one port device? Of course, we could have gone through and used the uh, reflection coefficient function to calculate this uh, mathematically, but instead we try, we chose to uh, solve this problem, determine this answer uh, graphically by plotting parametrically the reflection coefficient function on the complex gamma plane. If you recall, we first located the uh, point on the complex gamma plane, which corresponds to the load reflection coefficient, the short circuit. And then we plotted the um, uh, reflection coefficient uh, function mm -hmm. parametrically from that point. So we start at the load and we're moving back up the trans transmission line toward the input. The index Z, the position index Z, is decreasing in value and therefore the uh, angle, the reflection coefficient angle, is likewise, likewise decreasing in value. And so we're moving clockwise around the um, complex gamma plane as we plot parametrically the reflection coefficient function. What doesn't change as we move uh, uh, up the line back toward the input is the magnitude of this reflection coefficient function. For lossless transmission line, of course, the magnitude is independent of position. It's the same at every location. And so as we plot this, we are striking a circular arc around the complex gamma plane. Now, how far do we strike this arc? What is the arc angle? We can determine that by taking twice the electrical length of this transmission line. Since the uh, transmission line is an eighth, one eighth lambda, its electrical length is pi, pi over four radians. We double that since we have two beta L in the uh, reflection coefficient function, and that gives us a value of pi over two, or 90 degrees. And so we rotate our arc um, clockwise uh, for pi over two radians, or 90 degrees, and then we stop. At that point, the position of our uh, uh, pencil, uh, the end of that uh, parametric plot, is the value gamma in. And we see from that spo po uh, point that it is a reflection coefficient with the magnitude of one, of course, but with a phase now of pi over two. We started with a phase of pi. We subtracted from that a pi over two as we rotated uh, clockwise, and we're left then with a uh, re uh, reflection coefficient phase of pi over 2 or 90 degrees. Of course, we could also express this complex number as simply j, 0 plus j times 1 for this uh, point. So that's what we did before. We were just parametrically plotting uh, the reflection coefficient on the complex gamma plane from its initial point at the load all the way back to its beginning point at the input of that 1 8 lambda transmission uh, line. And that allows to parametrically determine the value of gamma n without having to uh, necessarily resort to using the mathematical um, expression for the reflection coefficient function. Let's say instead of reflection coefficient, we want to accomplish a similar thing. Uh, by it, it, uh, but instead of reflection coefficient, um, we want to determine the input impedance or the normalized input impedance. So it's the same situation physically. The line length is lambda over eight. The load is a short circuit. Uh, uh, in this case, in terms of impedance, that would be of course zero. And we want to know what is the input impedance for this um, eighth lambda, uh, eight, uh, lambda over eight transmission line. So how would we determine that? Um, one way, you might say, is well, perhaps we could parametrically plot the um, uh, line impedance function or the normalized line impedance function on the complex impedance plane. We did that for the reflection coefficient function, parametric plot gamma on the complex gamma plane. If we're using impedance, perhaps we should parametrically plot the line impedance function on the uh, complex impedance plane. But 
we never try to attempt that for several reasons. First of all, if we plotted it parametrically on uh, this um, function, this line impedance function, what we'd find is we wouldn't get nice, um, uh, simply um, drawn structures like circular arcs. Uh, as we moved uh, from the end of the line where the um, uh, uh, load was back up to the beginning, we find the line impedance function would um, move all over the complex impedance plane in ways that were not simply uh, plotted or understood. Um, <clears throat> likewise, and perhaps the biggest problem, is that as we moved across the complex impedance plane, we would uh, perhaps move to points um, that led us toward infinity. The val valid region of the uh, impedance plane, remember, is a half infinite space, where the valid region of the complex gamma plane is within the unit circle. And so when we plot, we know we are always going to stay in a finite region for the complex gamma plane. We have no such guarantee for the complex impedance plane. So we're not going to plot it parametrically in terms of the impedance function, but we still can find this answer using graphical means. So the way that we choose to solve this problem graphically, the way we choose to determine the input impedance of this uh, uh, transmission line is to uh, is precisely the same way as we did for the reflection coefficient. We are going to parametrically plot the reflection coefficient and we're going to plot it on the complex plane. To um, solve the problem of represent as impedance as opposed to reflection coefficient, what we're going to do is plot that on the complex gamma plane, which is the Smith chart. So we're going to parametrically plot on our Smith chart, which allows us to determine impedance problems, relationships between the load impedance and the input impedance by graphical means. So the first step in the process is to transform our load impedance into a load reflection coefficient. And on the Smith chart, that is very, uh, uh, very simple. We uh, look at the uh, intersection of the constant uh, resistance contours, a circle, and the constant uh, reactance contour, a circle. And um, uh, we find uh, at the intersection of the points correspond to the impedance, uh, that is the location of that impedance when mapped onto the complex gamma plane. So in the case of our short circuit load, the real part is zero. Well, the R equal to zero contour, of course, is the unit circle. Every location on the unit circle is uh, corresponds to an impedance whose real part is zero. Every point on the unit circle corresponds, therefore, to impedance, which is reactive, one that cannot absorb uh, any energy. The second contour part we have, the uh, x equal to zero uh, contour, if you recall, is the horizontal axis of the complex gamma plane. Every location uh, along the uh, um, horizontal axis, the real axis of the complex gamma plane uh, is a point that is mapped from the complex impedance plane and a point, a point that is purely real, a resistive load uh, maps onto that horizontal, um, uh, horizontal contour. And so what we find at the intersection of the R equal to zero circle and the X equal to zero circle, we have the uh, short circuit value where Z is equal to zero plus J zero, zero or short circuit. And that is the location then of the short circuit on the complex gamma plane. And of course, this was, uh, uh, we knew this, we didn't really need to find the circles to tell us that. The short circuit is one of our standard um, uh, impedance values, and we know its location when mapped to the complex gamma plane is at a value of gamma equal to minus one, a magnitude of one and a phase of pi, or 180 degrees, <clears throat> in other words. So now we're going to transform our load impedance uh, back up the transmission line to the input. We're going to move the value of our um, position um, um, descriptor uh, z, or index mm -hmm. position mm -hmm. index z. Um, and as we move back to the in, uh, beginning of the line, the input of the line, uh, that value will decrease. And so once again, the phase of the reflection coefficient uh, angle will uh, decrease as well, moving in a clockwise direction. And we're going to move a distance, of course, in this case of lambda over 8, 0.125 lambda. 
So from the standpoint of the Smith chart, when we move a distance of lambda over eight, we are moving away from the load, but we are of course then moving toward the input in uh, the parlance of the Smith chart, we would say we're moving toward the generator. And so we're gonna use the outer scale, the um, electrical distance scale uh, that's associated with wavelengths toward the generator. And as we do that, we find that these values are increasing as we move clockwise around the Smith chart. And that's because as we move toward the generator, we are rotating clockwise, clockwise around, I'm sorry, clockwise around the Smith chart um, as we move toward the generator, as we move away from the load. So again, this index doesn't really tell us anything physically per se, but it helps us solve the problem uh, as we are about to see. So the, pro the procedure that we follow, rather, is we uh, take the location of our load impedance um, uh, on the complex gamma plane on our Smith chart, which is right here at the value of gamma is equal to minus one. And then we take a straight edge and we would draw a line from the center of the Smith chart through that uh, load impedance point all the way across the outer scale. And what we're interested in is what is the value of the electrical uh, scale that is called wavelengths toward generator. Now at this point, this is a special case. This is our uh, uh, state line, our boundary, um, uh, where the scale uh, stops and starts all over again. And of course, we know that value to be zero uh, for wavelengths toward uh, uh, wavelengths toward the generator scale. So we get a value of zero. Again, that number by itself really has no significance to us. The wavelength toward uh, generator electrical um, um, normalized or electrical uh, distance scale of zero is just a mile marker. It marks the location uh, on the uh, outer scale uh, where we are for this uh, particular impedance, the, uh, the load impedance. And again, it's just a value of zero. What we use it for is to determine how far clockwise around the Smith chart do we need to rotate before we stop. So this is just like, again, an analogy on uh, uh, I-70 or an interstate and you're a mile marker 23 and you need to move uh, 30 miles further down the road. The question is, at what mile marker do you stop? If you're at 23 and you need to move 30 miles, well, you take 23, add 30, you need to stop at mile marker 53. And so you drive down the road till you see mile marker 53 and then you stop. Well, we're doing the same thing here. We're starting at a mile marker zero. We need to move along along the line a distance of 0.125 lambda, 0.125 lambda toward the input or toward the generator, which is why we're using the wavelengths toward generator scale. Now the math here is very simple. We start at mile marker zero, a uh, uh, an outer scale value of zero. We add uh, the length of our transmission line, uh, 0.125 lambda to that, and that gives us then a value of 0.125 lambda, which is the place where we need to stop rotating. So we go over here to uh, look at our wavelengths toward generator. We move along until we find that value of 1.125 uh, lambda, lambda over eight, and we put a little mark mm -hmm. on our, on our uh, Smith chart with our pencil. Again, we take our straight edge and we draw a line from that mark all the way down mm -hmm. to intersecting the center of the Smith chart. And so between these yellow lines, we have traced out then an angle which is equal to twice beta L. And again, we've seen before that angle is 90 degrees. So if we note this location on the outer scale of 0.125, again, that's just a sort of a mile marker. It doesn't have any physical meaning. What does have physical meaning, though, is where we cross the um, uh, angle of, um, of our reflection coefficient, and that value is 90 degrees. And so in this line that we've drawn, this yellow line, every point on that complex gamma plane, every point, rather, on that yellow line has a reflection coefficient phase value of, of pi over 2 or 90 degrees.
Okay, now we're prepared to uh, uh, form our parametric plot of the reflection coefficient on this complex gamma plane on the Smith chart. We start with the uh, load reflection uh, coefficient value of minus one or e to the j pi, and we're going to then strike a circular arc. We're going to plot the reflection coefficient again, which means we're going to strike a circular arc, which begins at the location of the short circuit at uh, uh, gamma L is equal to minus one, and we're going to rotate. We're going to rotate clockwise now until intersecting that yellow line, denoting the value of a quarter of a wavelength um, uh, at the toward generator scale. So this is the procedure we use, but what we're really doing, and this is so important to really keep in mind as you do this, that we are parametrically plotting the reflection coefficient on the complex gamma plane from a value of gamma L to a value of gamma N. All right, so this is the procedure that we use uh, on our Smith chart. We take our compass, put the pointy in at the center, put the pencil in here at the um, uh, load um, reflection coefficient, the load impedance, there the short circuit, and then we rotate, strike a circular arc as we rotate clockwise around the Smith chart. And we start at uh, a mile marker, our outer scale marker of zero, and we keep going until we run into the second yellow line, which is the marker for our uh, last uh, mile marker, lambda over eight. And so we rotate around until we hit that yellow line, and then we stop. So when we stop, we pick up our pencil and uh, the location where we stopped, that point where we stopped, is the proper location on the complex gamma plane for the correct value of gamma n. If we look at it, we know that that value is a gamma n of a magnitude of one, since it's on the unit circle, and a phase of pi over two, or 90 degrees. All right, here is zero, rotate right around to 90 degrees. We found that earlier from our parametric plot of the reflection coefficient, that the gamma n is uh, e to the j pi over two. Now, we may or may not be interested in that. Remember, in this particular part of the problem, we're trying to determine the input impedance, not the input reflection coefficient. We may not all have any interest in gamma n. All we need to know is that we are in the right uh, position on the complex gamma plane for gamma n. The point that, th uh, the value of gamma that that point represents is the proper value of gamma n, whatever that value happens to be. All right, here we then finish up the third part of uh, the problem is uh, the first part was we transform from the load impedance to the load reflection coefficient. The second part, we parametrically plot the reflection coefficient to transform gamma L into gamma N. And now we're gonna transform gamma L, gamma N rather, back into the input impedance uh, value. And we simply take the point where we stop and we look to see uh, what circles, what contours of constant resistance and constant uh, reactance intersect with that point. Well, with respect to uh, uh, contours of constant resistance, the circle that intersects that point is the R equal to zero circle, the outer uh, the, uh, um, the uh, unit circle, rather. Um, and of course, um, that tells us that the uh, real part of this uh, impedance is equal to zero, since all of the uh, impedances that map to the unit circle uh, are uh, impedances that are purely reactive and that the real part is equal to zero. Now, what about the reactive part? We see here that the contour that comes up and intersects that point is this contour. This is the contour of constant reactance. And again, there's a number when that contour intersects the unit circle. We look at that number and and in fact, in this case, it is the wrong number. I like this Excel Hero uh, Smith chart. I think it has good fidelity. I think it has enough detail without having too much detail. I think it's easy to use. But there is one problem with that Excel Hero Smith chart in that there is a typo at specifically this point. If we look at the contours of constant impedance here, we get 0.6 and then 0.7, and then 0.8, and then 0.9, and then 0.1. 
and then it goes to 1.2 and 1.4. Clearly this value is a typo. It is 1.0. So this is the 1.0 contour. X is equal to 1.0 contour now that intersects with this red dot. So we pick up our pencil, and since it uh, the R equal to zero circle intersects with that point, and the X equal to one circle intersects with that point, then we conclude that the input impedance is zero plus J1, or in other words, J. Now, why is it one point to make sure that we understand why is this reactance value plus one and not minus one. Again, it's not because there are no minus signs associated with these numbers. It's because we are in the upper half of the complex gamma plane. We are in the inductive region of the complex gamma plane. And because we are in the inductive region, we can interpret that contour of constant reactance as a positive. Again, in the bottom half of the Smith chart, the contours of constant reactance are likewise uh, denoted as positive values. And so you have to realize you're in the bottom half and understand that's the capacitive region and therefore those values are actually negative. Again, that may not make any sense to you as to why that is true at this point, but later on we'll find out the reason that Smith charts are constructed in that way. So in this uh, unit, we've done uh, we've done two things. We've transformed the uh, load reflection coefficient of minus one to an input reflection coefficient of e to the j pi over two by parametrically plotting the reflection coefficient function on the uh, complex gamma plane. And then we went through and showed that we could determine the input impedance from the load impedance on the Smith chart by following the three steps, transforming uh, load impedance into reflection coefficient, load reflection coefficient, um, transforming load reflection coefficient into gamma n, and then transforming gamma n back into load impedance. And that's what we did um, in the second part. And of course, the important thing uh, to understand, and hopefully it's evident, is these two parts were exactly the same. We were doing the same thing. We were plotting parametrically the reflection coefficient gamma on the complex gamma plane. And I stress this because oftentimes when engineers, electrical engineers, do Smith charts, this whole notion of drawing lines and striking, striking circular arcs in one direction or the other seems like some sort of, um, you know, arbitrary, magical um, operation that has to be done. You do these, do these things and you can get the right answer. The question is, why are we doing these things? Uh, again, one of the things I talk about is that most electrical engineers, or many electrical engineers certainly, would not recognize that the Smith chart is plotted on the complex gamma plane. And because of that, most electrical engineers, or many electrical engineers, would not recognize that when they are striking circular arcs on the Smith chart, what they're doing is parametrically plotting the reflection coefficient from one end of the line to the other end of the line, or perhaps back. It's important to understand not only how to get the right answer from the Smith chart, it's very important to understand why the Smith chart gives you those right answers. And it's not particularly difficult. Once you understand what that Smith chart is, a mapping of all the uh, 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 Cartesian uh, contours of the normalized impedance plane mapped onto the gamma plane, and understand that the Smith chart is plotted inside the valid region of the uh, of complex gamma plane, then uh, the rest of it uh, is fairly straightforward and simple to be able to provide you answers. You can transform from impedance to reflection coefficient and back again, and you can transform reflection coefficient from one in the line to the other in the line and back again as well. And then all the steps make sense. Things like, do I rotate counterclockwise or do I rotate clockwise? Well, am I increasing my position index Z or am I decreasing my position index Z? Am I increasing the reflection coefficient phase or am I decreasing the reflection coefficient phase? All those things um, 
are uh, hopefully evident if you understand uh, what the Smith chart is and how it is corrected. And again, that's what we're after with respect to education um, and, and, uh, and your understanding as an engineer, you want to know not only how to get the right answer, more importantly, you want to know why the answer is right.